Hello, everyone. This is another episode of todebate.net. Another jingle, a little music, a little dance. I'm Sebastian, one of your co hosts. And as usual, my other co host, who's cracking and laughter because of my non jokes, I suppose, is Dirk. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. And you're funny either way. I'm not sure why you call this a non joke. Let's not get carried away. Although I have been preparing, and I think I mentioned this before, a stand up comedy show. And I'm preparing my script for that but i've been preparing for 10 months now so i better get it out at some point um is it about podcasting your comedy show i, I mean there i'm sure if you think a little bit about it and brainstorm it then we find plenty of podcaster jokes as well and they usually start with a german and a frenchman go to a bar or something <laughs> like that <laughs> a guilty bar in new york um yeah i have to think more about this i'm i'm thankfully not the comedian here so it's your stand-up comedy show well, just saying well you know the, the the problem with podcasting and microphones is that they can be used for bad things right you can be monitored oh yes you saw what oh, I, you saw man. you saw what i just did here <laughs> i didn't see that I didn't coming see, i i <laughs> thought you'd you'd be going towards that direction but i had to help you and nudge you uh, yeah, thank you, you, you thank you've you. been better than me over the past few recordings on transitioning to our motion and the reason why we're laughing and there was this uh, awkward silence on your side because you were trying to see the, <laughs> the connecting the dots with emotion is because today we're going to debate about the following motion and that is european countries have become surveillance states what prompted you to uh, suggest that motion this is another one of your suggested motions how come that you always want to know how I come up with motions? The, the reason I want to know is because I don't see any issues. I mean, it's obvious that European countries are not civilian states. <laughs> <laughs> and, yes, and it's pretty obvious that you already <laughs> tried to prime our listeners, really? which means, oh. yeah, oh, yeah. How is it, How did that happen? So what prompted that? I keep reading about how heavy China goes on its citizens surveilling them. I keep hearing about all the beautiful things the EU is doing to protect its citizens like GDPR and such. And I keep hearing about Mark Zuckerberg being criticized for lack of uh, data protection. We as Google, as employees of Google, hear quite a bit of criticism on Google as well. And it strikes me as slightly hypocritical if I follow the news on legislation that has been passed in the cu last couple of years in the EU. I'm quite frustrated about some of the laws that have been put in effect in the last two or three years in Germany alone. And if you look at this, then I do think we are not any less a surveillance state than any other high-tech country on this earth. But uh, yeah, that's that's for the listeners to decide. This is how the flip of the coin plays the motions. Um, so you're going to argue against it. I'm arguing for it. But as it happens every once in a while, this is where I naturally land as well. All right. All right, so why don't you get started? And you have been awarded two minutes of free uninterrupted time to expose your wow. arguments. Okay, let's do this. Dirk goes first and argues for the motion. So what is a surveillance state? A surveillance state is a state that gathers data on its citizens, specifically about its behavior and no matter what the citizen actually has done in the past or if the citizen is doing anything wrong. So a surveillance state just gathers everything it can get its hands on. In Europe, we've been proud to protect our privacy in the past. As I said, um, there is plenty of legislation that has global effects and some argue very positive effects on privacy, like, for instance, GDPR. And we praise ourselves for being sensitive to data privacy issues, especially in Germany, that's the case. But in France, I think it's very similar. We praise ourselves up to the point that we are even in 2015 pushed back on the safe harbor agreement, a data sharing agreement with the US with the reasoning that it's not protecting privacy of uh, European citizens enough. But at the same time, what happened in reality was that actually we scaled up levels uh, of surveillance to a point that is outright scary and at least on the same level as in all these other countries. France, Germany, UK, all three European superpowers, as you could argue, uh, legalized broad scale data collection and cross nation data sharing. So whenever they are bound to not spy on their own citizens, basically they ask the neighbor to do it for them. And that is just the same level of surveillance in the end, because when you share these data bits in the EU, then you get everything you want to 
and can spy on people, on companies, on other nationals, whatever have you. And also, you don't have to take my word for it. So let's see if I get that pronunciation right. Uh, let me quote Mark Trevidic, uh, the former chief terrorism investigator for the French judicial system. And he said, if an intelligence law is not well conceived and rational, it could easily become a formidable weapon of repression. An intelligence law should not only protect citizens against terrorism, but also against the state. We in France are doing neither. There is a total absence of control. And this is why I think it's very worrying. And this is why I think it keeps building up. And now on to Sebastian. Let's hear his argument. It's easier today to claim that there is surveillance everywhere than to claim that there is no surveillance or limited surveillance or control surveillance. And even from that point onwards, it's very tempting to go and say, it's the state's sole intention to just monitor each and everyone's behavior. But I want to remind our listeners of two things. Uh, number one, the state is us. The state is composed of all of us citizens. And the second thing, and I'll, that I'll, and I'll expand on these, these two points in a second, surveillance can also be something positive when it's for our own good. Surveillance has this very pejorative connotation. It doesn't have to be that way. It has its risks, which you highlight, and I agree with the risk you're highlighting, but I disagree, obviously, on the fact that the European countries are already in a, a, a status of being surve purely described as surveillance states. So on the first point, the fact that the state is us, all of us human beings living in those countries, that means we should be careful not to be vague when we describe who's controlling us, who is surveying us, the government, the police, the army, counterterrorism departments, and to ask ourselves, to what ends? Is it an attempt at hijacking a democratic process or something else? And that's my second point. But to just finish off on this first point, it's just to realize that we're doing this to ourselves. We're electing these politicians. And as far as I know, European countries are democracies. We do elect our parliaments and our governments. So we have a say in this. If we're not happy with it, we can even run up, run up for elections ourselves. So let's not forget and place the burden on others as if they're just some vague entity. They're actually us. The second point is, I think there is a genuine desire to protect the population from threats. We may perfectly disagree on what methods should be used and what kind of counterpowers need to be put in place. But let's not also consider that all data collection is surveillance. Some data collection or some tracking of behavior I want to believe, or at least most of it, can be used to offer better and more tailored services, not just by private companies, by the way, but also the public sector. And the EU, just to close off, and I have more arguments afterwards, uh, has been built after the Second World War to establish peace, to establish a stable federation to help develop trade, free movement of, of people, and this is very much the case today. So I, I, I hope people feel that way, and they don't, are not scared by these words of surveillance and data collection. And as you pointed out, we also, we Europeans, are very clear when other countries like the US are very invasive in terms of collecting data or trying to get data from us, and we just say no. So I don't think European countries are in a, a state today where they can be considered as civilian states. Now, it's Dirk's turn. Let's hear his rebuttal. Oh, by now we have broad agreements in place how we share data with the US. Don't get me wrong. There is plenty of European citizens' data shared between Europe and the, uh, the US. I don't have any doubts that there is plenty more shared than you would deem appropriate for the use cases that people cite. Current EU systems are not collecting these data for, for negative or for suppressive means. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that the French government collects data to suppress its people, nor is the UK government trying to crack down on dissidents or the German government trying to block people from, from voicing their opinions. Today, these systems are powerful systems. And this is exactly why checks and balances need to put in place protective checks and balances at times of peace and at times of democracy because they are there to protect us from the state when things get worse. And there have been countless cases in history where, where a benevolent positive government just flips and is taken over and all of a sudden all these systems that are put in place right now to protect us from terrorists or just help us working through our own 
own uh, fears are used for other means. And actually, it is a slippery slope. So uh, let, let me give you an example. Just two weeks after the November 2015 terrorist attacks in Paris, during which 130 people were killed, two weeks after, France adopted the International Electronic Communications Law that gave massive rights to law enforcement and terrorism fighting units and opened up the doors for massive data sharing. Similar laws have since been put in place in the UK and in Germany. Uh, in Germany, also in the past year, Police got more rights to arrest people. Government agencies got more rights to share data with each other. Laws that basically protected citizens for unlawful investigation, unlawful surveillance were, were cut down. So all these things happen right now, all in the sense of protecting us from terrorism. Now, what already is happening is that what yesterday was an, uh, a law to protect us from terrorism is today's law to protect us from criminal acts. We have countries like Turkey where some opinions you voice in a newspaper can be colored as a terrorist act. And it's the same laws that we put in place right now that may tomorrow just be used against journalists or, or dissidents uh, that just ha happen to have a different uh, political opinion. So I do think it's worrying. I do think it's a big deal. I do think we have an increasing, increasing level of surveillance happening in the EU. All big countries do that right now. So all the small countries will follow. And unfortunately, Europe is a model for many other countries on this planet. So it's only getting worse. And I'm worried about it. Now it's Sebastian's turn. Let's hear it. So you touched upon the November attacks, November 2015 attacks in Paris, and you mentioned something that will be the subject of one of our debates, upcoming debates, about whether laws should be passed in an emotional context. And I would agree right now without talking about a, without debating that they probably should not. We should probably reflect instead of just voting measures suddenly. Um, but that's beyond the point of the, of the debate today. And the fact is that these laws have actually allowed among other things, to foil new attempts. There have been a number of suspects uh, arrested across France, Germany, Belgium uh, over the past couple of years to prevent new attacks from happening. And it's very easy to say, well, we don't know if this was because of the data which was intercepted or not. Well, the thing is we'll never know until there's a proper investigation of these investigations. That probably will not happen before a, a few decades. We should probably not trust our governments completely, but I don't want to distrust them completely either. And I think the EU does have our best interest at heart. Why? And I, I want to be careful again, I'm saying the EU as if it's a vague entity. The EU is us, it's all of us. We elect these people to represent ourselves. You mentioned the fact that uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union had struck down the, the so-called safe harbor data sharing agreement that had allowed, well, that would have allowed the transfer of European citizens data to the US. Another example is the European Court of Justice, which has set limits on telecommunication data retention. So I, I want to believe that we have institutions and these checks and balances, as you rightly put it, to oversee all these things. And actually, they exist. These oversight mechanisms do exist. They're often put in place when new powers are being authorized for the police or the army. And I give examples, and, and I won't be specific on countries, but it's, I try to make it a generic analysis of the kind of oversight mechanisms which have been put in place. For instance, Requests have to be made to a minister or and a judge. Depends on the country. Uh, it can be a single or a double review, uh, especially in the case of a bulk interception warrant. In many cases, there's a time limitation, uh, which is extends for a few weeks or a few months. Sometimes it can be only authorized under very exceptional conditions, or they, they have to be at adequate legal safeguards. So it's not a black or white thing. There are safeguards which are trying to be put in place. You may judge that it's not enough. But there's an attempt at that. I think our politicians, our governments are conscious of that and that try to do their best effort to try and contain uh, these new powers while still trying to do the, the job of counterterrorism. I think another example is GDPR. You keep mentioning it, but I think most privacy and protection laws for citizens come from Europe. And it's actually a stereotype that Europe protects its citizens much more better than much better than the rest of the world. And in fact, these GDPR uh, uh, regulations have been exported uh, to a number of countries around the world. So it's not as if we're not leading in that area of privacy and protection of our citizens. Now, it's not to say that data collection, storage, use, and personal data protection measures are perfect, nor even 
nor even perfectly implemented. And we should keep watch, as we're doing today with our debate. But to go to the extent in describing the EU countries as surveillance states, states I think is to me far-fetched. If that's the case, and I'll conclude on that, if Europe has become a series of surveillance states, what would you say of Russia, the US, or China? Final statements. Dirk goes first. Honestly, I don't think it's a matter of degree. You're a surveillance state or you're not. When are you a surveillance state? If you survey the behavior of your people, no matter if they are accused of anything wrongdoing, without having a, a judicial warrant up front. And this is exactly what happens. The things that you mentioned are just not true. At least not in Germany. And I last time I checked, Germany has been a kind of an important country in the EU. And in Germany, for instance, if you happen to walk uh, close to a demonstration of people walking the street, no matter how peaceful, no matter the topic, chances are that police is recording your faces and putting it through a face recognition because in Germany also it's illegal to, to hide your face. Um, if you walk there with your phone, then the, your phone positioning data is registered there. And right now they argue about le legislation that they can start surveying your phone. So I just disagree. We are a surveillance state because we survey people at massive scale right now. And surveillance changes behavior and surveillance changes how free people feel. It kills freedom in the end. And as soon as an oppressive regime comes to power, these systems are put in place to oppress people. <laughs> Sebastian. So I think we fundamentally agree on something that you've nailed very precisely, which is the degree. Whether there's a degree or not in, in being a surveillance state, I firmly disagree that it's black or white. I think there's a spectrum. I think on the extreme end of that spectrum, you have a country like China, which is monitoring its population very precisely. And I think on the other end of that spectrum, you have the European Union and its countries. And in between, you have the US and a bunch of other countries on the planet. And that's why I'm very uh, clear on this aspect that we do need to have independent scrutiny and judicial review of any data or person monitoring in our countries. And that requires us, the state is us, to make sure that we keep a watch on this and we elect the people or we run up for elections ourselves to make sure that this is happening, that we both have a safe country and at the same time protection of our privacy. In conclusion, I will firmly stand against the motion which is that Europe, European countries have not become surveillance states. Secretly you're agreeing with me. I don't know, I, I'm, I think I'm less privacy conscious than you are for sure. Uh, I think you're much more careful, especially when you go to the US or everything related to privacy. I'm, I'm much more lax on this and maybe I'm wrong, but I do think, I do, I do stand by what I said. In any, in any case, it would be surprising that at the end of the, it would be funny in one episode if you record it and at the end I say, you know what, you convinced me. You won. <laughs> 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 maybe that will happen, I don't know, on the hundred, uh, on the hundred debate. No, but I, I do I do think that the world is more complex in most instances of, what, of the topics we debate, that it's difficult to paint a black or white picture for most things. So that's that's where I think I do disagree on the, on the degree or the spe spectrum notion. Uh, I think you can be honest or dishonest, that's a black or white, but I think being surve surveying country, I think it's sim simplifying the, de the, the debate, in my opinion, if you say, if you just portray as being surveying or not. At a massive scale, so we shouldn't we shouldn't forget what it actually means. It means like re literally recording and storing a ton of information about people who haven't done anything wrong, without requiring your per um, permission to do so, and by the way, without your right to actually even learn about it. So uh, again, I know it best from Germany. In Germany, there are a couple of fights being fought right now in court where people try to get the to the point that you have a right to at least request information on what is being stored about you. Remember, that's at the core of GDPR. So when it comes to how we regulate business, this is actually common sense that we say, hey, you cannot store data about people without telling them what it's for and why you store it. When it comes to state business, then all of a sudden, everything is a matter of security at some point. So with that, with that cloak, you can basically hide away anything. And 
I, I would say we store way more than people realize and many of the protective measures we put in place are not there to protect our citizens, it's to protect EU countries from other states. It's like, like seeing the data as valuable and not wanting to share more than necessary with other countries is not the same as protecting civil rights. So to your point, is China doing more of this? Sure it is. If you ask uh, Chinese citizens, do they feel all oppressed and feel like, oh, this is bad? I doubt it. I think most most Chinese citizens would basically tell you, oh, yeah, that I feel so much safer uh, because we do this. And it, it avoids terrorism and criminal acts and everybody behaves better. What should be wrong about this? I'm not sure if we are so far away from this. The key difference, I think, here that you're neglecting, in my opinion, is that every four, five, six years in our democracies, powers in place change and they change completely. The entire mm -hmm. administration can change. Mm -hmm. And that includes the US, by the way. So in the China, that's not the case. I, the system is rigged in such a way that, you know, even the president, the current president of China has changed the, the law. So in theory, he could be around for the next decades, just like Putin in Russia. So yeah. the advantage that we have is that we can change things. So if we feel that this is going the wrong way and we can convince enough people, then we can actually elect people who can protect us and represent us better. But if, if this is what citizens want, like more civilians, then the thing is, the, the, diff, the, the, the issue that I, I, I struggle with, and that's more of a meta comment, um, is that when we vote, for, we vote for elections, you vote for a party or a person, but you basically vote for the entire program, even if you disagree with pieces of it. Right? And that's the, that's the struggle I've always had when I, I go to elections and I go vote, is that I don't, I don't agree with everything. I mostly agree with, with you know, one side, And, but, and that's why I've been always tempted to actually run up for elections myself. So at least when I vote, even I get one vote and it's my own vote, well, at least I've, I've been true to my principles, which is I want to, this is my opinion and I cannot vote for anything else. Like I don't want to be like whatever, monitored or you know, I'm in favor or, or against the, the decriminalization of uh, cannabis, for instance, whatever it is. Yeah, so this is what uh, I struggle you know with. Yeah, and uh, yeah, by now I know that it takes only giving you one debate motion where you have to defend another stance than your own and then you're confused. I'm not sure if I trust you to vote on principle. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. But at least our debates enlighten me on taking uh, taking the other side and trying to see, True. well, you know, is am I, am I ignoring or am I... Am I not seeing the other side, uh, the other side's position, and and that maybe can allow you to to craft legislation which is better better suited, right? Or, be, or just be more conscious of the risks that so, you may not have thought of before. So here's here's the thing, we live in an age where massive technical systems are put in place where the layman doesn't understand the system and its consequences. Neither are the politicians debating about it. It is pretty obvious when you look at things like Article 13 that in the end, even so it doesn't say it in the legislative uh, text, it basically will result in an upload filter-like system, which in the end will, will fail to do what it's set out to do. And yeah, we may overturn it in a couple of years. We may need to roll it back. The interesting thing about that process is We are trusting politicians to make decisions on things they cannot understand and we don't understand either of a va with vast consequences. And one consequence that's pretty obvious is a ton of data is collected about me by, and it's sold to me by telling me I'm now safer than before. Well, I haven't been in danger before. Just because there are terrorist attacks in this country doesn't mean I'm more safe or more, more endangered right now than I have been a couple of years ago. And... I'm, I'm even fine with some of these measures if I would have had a chance to really protest or, uh, or find out about it. But what do I know? Imagine, imagine at some point I try to fly to the US and I'm denied entry on, on some reason. And that's when I learned that I was uh, surveyed for a couple of years. There's no requirement for anyone to tell me if I'm being surveilled. And they get around it by surveilling basically everyone on everything. And uh, therefore, I have to watch my behavior all of a sudden because all of a sudden it matters what I write to you on WhatsApp, what books I, I, I read, what videos I watch, because all of this leaves an electronic trail. And this is, this is scary. So two things. On the, on the last point that you raise, I think for 99% of the population, the problem is not being surveyed, in my opinion. But... 
the fact that authorities can make a mistake, and the mistake will be at your detriment. So your name may be the same, sound the same name as the one of someone who's maybe has committed murder or, or crimes. And it and the problem is, as as it has been the case already, when the U.S. had drafted a no-fly list, like people who are banned from flying, because people with Arabic sounding names had very uh, the exact same names, they were actually banned from flying. And even though they got it corrected, they were still prevented or had issues from flying from one country to 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 the U.S. So I think the the main issue for me is this: it's mistakes, because what you know the books you read or whatever, like no one's no one cares. Like they're not going to be like. I mean, and maybe this is our next debate actually about the, you know, trying to maybe seek content that would have been banned, but assuming the content is not banned, you have access to the books and the videos you want to watch and the books you want to read. I don't think the problem is, oh, states are going to know what you're doing because nobody cares. I mean, nobody will look into the details. They could if, there's, if, if you have a rogue uh, policeman looking into the database and wanting to know what you're doing. But I don't think that would be the general case. I think that the general case is just making mistakes and assumptions based on what you're doing and flagging you as a potential threat when you're not. I think this is the risk. Yeah, yeah, uh, sort of. It's not the actual not, content. Not exclusively. First off, it's not just about you. So yeah, the 99% of the law-abiding citizen who have nothing to hide, yada, 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 yes, for them it's not an issue because they never encounter it. You know liberal societies by watching how they treat their dissidents and their artists and their journalists. And this is actually the problem because if I collect all the data there is of the 99% of people who have nothing to hide, then I don't need to collect the people of those 1% who try something to hide, uh, to hide something. And there are legitimate reasons to hide stuff. Sometimes societies turn against uh, things we consider being totally fine. For instance, there are countries that uh, all of a sudden turn really hard against uh, homosexualism. How do you protect them? If you have all your data collected, then they don't need to know who is gay in your, in, in your circle of friends. They just need to observe who you engage with in what manner. Uh, that's just one example. Honestly, if I go protesting and every once in a while there's an issue that really brings me to the street, it's not often, but sometimes it is the, uh, the case, I'm on purpose not bringing my phone. I leave every electronic piece of equipment at home because I expect this to be tracked. Basically, the moment you go to the street and protest, you have to live with the fact that authorities are recording you, having you in a database stored as a potential noisemaker. And this probably scares some people away from protesting. Now, protesting is, is, is a civil liberty. It's me voicing my opinion. And all these things change behavior. This is really where it comes down to. It's not as easy as saying, I have nothing to hide. I have nothing to fear. Nothing going to ever happen to me. Agreed. Agreed. But I was not, you know, my, my, I agree with, with almost everything you said. My point was not about saying you have nothing to hide. My point is, even if you have nothing to hide, you may be subject to police inquiry by mistake. And I think mistakes happen more often than we think. Not just Agreed. because of a name mismatch, but just because you're suspected or you're p potentially a threat. It's like minority report, right? Except this is happening for real now. We can actually have these signals and they may actually uh, incur a, a number of, of mistakes. Uh, perfectly agree with, with you on the on the demonstrations. In fact, we have seen this just in the past few weeks in France with a with the yellow vest, the gilets jaunes mm -hmm. riots, and they have been forbidden to demonstrate or they have been forced to go in specific areas. So we already see this. Uh, and this controversy also about uh, the monitoring by, by the police or, or, rec or recording of, of the events. Anyway, um, let's wrap up on this and I'll wrap up with one thing on my end. And that's to say we have European elections coming up in one month. Oh yeah. So Europeans that's... listening to this debate, please go vote. Yeah, we have elections at the end of May don't forget to vote. And while we are at the topic of voting, also vote on our page, please, please, please. <laughs> to debate.eu. There is a thumbs up, thumbs down thingy where you can let us know whose arguments convinced you most. Is it Sebastian's stance that no, we are not surveillance states and there are degrees of surveillance? Or is it my position that it's a black and white thing? You either are a surveillance state or not. And uh, yeah, let us know. We are eager to learn uh, about whether or not we convinced you and maybe even changed your opinion. Whatever you deem appropriate to share your feedback. All right. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye.
I was reading the, deep, the title. Deep, deep in your heart. No, deep, deep in your heart. You want to agree with me. I was reading the, the, the motion and I forgot I was against. 